Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you are connecting from. And a warm welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the Dispute Resolution Interest Group of the American Society of International Law. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Remy Gerbet. Uh, I'm a partner at Hughes Hubbard & Reed in Washington, and an academic at Queen Mary University. And with my uh, co-chair of the Dispute Resolution Interest Group, uh, Belen Ibanez of uh, Curtis uh, Malay and, and with the Drake Secretary Leonard Vazoler from Hughes Hubbard, uh, we are absolutely delighted to welcome you to this uh, webinar. As you know, the uh, topic of this webinar is resolving disputes in ancient civilizations and covering the roots of modern day arbitration and litigation. And to uh, help us uncover the roots of modern day litigation and arbitration, we uh, have put together a fantastic panel of uh, uh, specialists, uh, academics, who I look forward to introducing to you in just one second. Uh, before I do so, uh, however, just a couple of logistical points. Uh, the first one about the format uh, of this webinar, which uh, will follow the roundtable format, whereby we're going to ask our panelists a number of questions which uh, to, together should help us uncover the roots of modern day arbitration and litigation. Uh, the, the round table discussion will be will last uh, 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 a bit less than uh, uh, an hour. Uh, towards the end of it, we'll have uh, some time for questions from the audience. And then when we reach the end of this uh, round table and the questions from the audience, we are going to switch to a second webinar called the Continue the Conversation webinar where the uh, participants, the delegates, you will be able to ask questions and interact directly with the uh, panelists on the topics of this webinar. Uh, a, a link to the Zoom meeting for that second webinar will be shared in the chat uh, uh, box of this uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, now, this webinar is uh, qualifies for CLE uh, credits. Uh, and so uh, at the time of registration, you should have all received a link with the uh, materials for this webinar. Uh, the link also appears, I think, in the chat box as we speak. And if you want to qualify for CLE credits, what you have to do is send an email to uh, Leonard Vazoler using the email address that appears in the chat box and uh, uh, attaching the form, the CLE form uh, that should appear in there as well. And you've got to write down the CLE uh, code, which my co-chair Belen will uh, read to you midway through the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our great panelists in, uh, in uh, alphabetical order, starting with Professor Buis, Professor Emiliano Buis. Uh, professor Buis is a, a tenured professor of, of both ancient Greek and international law at the University of Buenos Aires in a uh, Argentina. He has been a fellow at several academic institutions, including uh, uh, Brown University's uh, Department of Classics, Harvard University's Center for Hellenic Studies, uh, the Alexander Onassis Public Benefit Foundation in Athens, uh, and also the Center for Epigraphical and Paleographical Studies at Ohio State University. His uh, research interests include Athenian law, Greek drama, especially comedy, if I'm not mistaken, and the theory and history of international law in antiquity. He is, uh, like his colleagues uh, here, a prolific author on these uh, questions, and one of his latest books, Taming Ares, War, Interstate Law, and Humanitarian Discourse in Classical Greece, was published by Brill uh, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Moving on to uh, Professor Minarova, Yana Minarova, uh, professor Minarova is a full professor of history and cultures of uh, Asia and Africa and the head of the Institute of Ancient uh, uh, Near Eastern Studies at Charles University in Prague. She uh, graduated in Egyptology and cuneiform studies at the Faculty of Arts uh, of Charles University, and she has a PhD in Philology, Languages of Asia and Africa from the same university. Her research interests uh, focus on political, social, and economic history of the Near East and Egypt in particular in the second millennium BC, with uh, special attention to uh, documents from the so-called Amarna archive. Uh, 
and she's the author of a series of monographs, including a language of uh, Amarna, language of diplomacy, perspectives on the Amarna letters and the Crossroad uh, series. Uh, last but not least, Professor Paul Duplessis is a professor uh, of uh, uh, Roman law. He holds the chair of Roman law at the University of Edinburgh. He is a legal historian with a focus on complex set of relationships between law and society in a historical context. His main field of research is uh, Roman law, with specific reference to property, obligations, and to a lesser extent, persons and family. Um, in the context of his interest in law and society, his research also focuses on a, a further period where Roman legal principles were used to create law, namely the period of the European Jus Commune uh, in the Middle Ages. So, that's it for the introductions of our great speakers. And I'm going to start with a uh, generic question, if I may. I will address questions to uh, individual uh, panelists, but please, of course, feel free to jump in and to, uh, to uh, uh, intervene if you have something to say. So first general question by way of introduction, uh, Jana, perhaps at a high level, can you uh, describe for us how lawmaking and uh, law uh, giving or, or, or the application of law worked in the uh, ancient world, specifically in Egypt. Uh, and one question, I guess, that that, that um, people may have in the back of their mind is whether or not we had courts or centralized courts in uh, Egypt, and, uh, and and whether all disputes were referred to the same courts, or whether you had different fora for different types of courts. For example, for disputes with citizens, non-citizens, I'm sure the, the, these are issues that are relevant to uh, the, 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 the three different periods we're covering today. So, Yana, please feel free to start, and, and uh, Emiliano and Paul, please, please do feel free to jump in. Sure, happy. So, in the ancient world, and particularly within the Near East and Egypt, the legal framework reflected a representation of the divine realm. However, it's essential to refrain from the universally equating individual concepts and resulting legal provisions across the entire region and throughout the different historical periods uh, spanning from the third to the first millennium BC. So as just uh, as distinct communities and their histories varied, so did their perspectives on the legal system and of course our interpretation of it. Well, during the third millennium BC, uh, Southern Mesopotamia saw the emergence of a system of coexisting city-states engaged in trade, forming alliances and participating in armed conflicts. But in contrast, Egypt, situated in the Nile Basin, existed as a singular entity without a political or military analogous counterpart in its vicinity. So consequently, while surviving records from the mid third millennium document, a border dispute between the cities of Lagash and Uma in the southern Mesopotamia, reflecting territorial disagreements, comparable sources from Egypt are actually notably absent. Nevertheless, for us, this border dispute between the two Mesopotamian cities holds significant historical and legal importance because Anatum, the ruler of Lagash, emerged victorious in this protracted conflict and commemorated his triumph with an inscription of the so-called stele of the vultures, which is currently held at the Louvre. The inscription on the stele details the diverse legal procedures employed, highlighting the repeated oaths compelled upon the defeated ruler of Uma. These oaths were necessary for the ruler to comply with the terms of the treaty including the commitment not to trespass into the territory of Lagash again. And importantly, any violation of the treaty provisions would invoke divine punishment as stipulated in the text. Moreover, the inscription includes curses directed at those who would breach these provisions. The text makes it evident that despite presenting the punishment in a divine context, the actual circumstances involved elements such as military coercion, ultimatums, and arbitration to address purported sorry, violations of border agreements. Well, on the other hand, in ancient Egypt, the legal system was intricately tied to the divine realm through the principle of Ma'at, an ethical concept signifying truth, order, or even cosmic balance personified by the goddess Ma'at. She embodied the divine harmony and equilibrium of the universe, including the enduring nature of kingship. Ma'at served as a guardian against the constant threat of chaos, known as Isfet in Egyptian, which could disrupt the orderly functioning of the world. 
This concept permeated every aspect of Egyptian society and the environment, extending to the regular cycles of seasons, the life and reaching floods of the Nile, and the orderly conduct on the inhabitants of the Nile Valley. Even in the instructions of Ptahotep dated to the 6th dynasty and therefore dated between the 24th and 22nd century BC, it is emphasized, and I quote, there is punishment for him who passes over its, that means Ma'at's, laws, end of quote, underscoring the significance of adherence to the principles of Ma'at and the legal and ethical framework of Egyptian society. Nevertheless, in Egyptian legal documents, there exist other crucial terms, such as hap, denoting law, ritual, as well as encompassing ceremony, and net ah, signifying custom. These terms are integral components of the ma'at order, serving as the instruments through which ma'at is upheld. The term hap or hepu is found, for instance, in royal decrees, containing both royal commands and prohibitions or penalties. Broadly speaking, these hepu function as legal sources and play a role in all legal matters, encompassing both judicial and commercial proceedings. It's also noteworthy that these legal principles applied universally, irrespective of one's social status or gender. And interestingly, it wasn't until the 7th or 6th century BC that professional courts and judges were established in Egypt. So up until the 26th dynasty, the court of justice, referred to as Jajat in the Old Kingdom or Kenabat from the Middle Kingdom onwards, comprised of officials who held both administrative and judicial duties and powers. Thank you, Yana. Very interesting, and and thanks for uh, for starting, you know, with Mesopotamia in addition to uh, to Egypt. Very interesting to hear the difference, you know, in terms of the centralization in uh, in, in Egypt and uh, uh, as opposed to the city states of Mesopotamia. Uh, very interesting also to hear the, uh, the, the the relationship between the divine, the religious, and uh, and the legal. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to come back to that. At least I, I hope we will. Uh, but, but perhaps, uh, Emiliano or Paul, if you want to uh, uh, likewise tell us a bit more about, uh, about Greece or Rome, how, how lawmaking or law-giving work at a very high level by way of introduction. And if you're able to yeah. draw parallels or distinctions with, with what we've heard from Yana about Mesopotamia and, uh, and Egypt, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. Uh, well, the question about uh, uh, lawmaking and lawgiving in, in ancient Greece is, is always very, very interesting because there is a lot of complex processes which are influenced there by political structures, social norms, which are very typical also to, to the Hellenic uh, world. Uh, so in, in general terms, and just to, to, to start a little uh, uh, answering the question, we should bear in mind that ancient Greece was not a unified nation. So it was basically a collection of independent city-states, maybe a thousand, according to uh, recent uh, studies. And each of these city-states or polis has its own government, its own laws, its own institutions. So uh, in Athens, and this is of course, classical Athens is the city we, we know best. Uh, we are sure that the citizens participated quite directly in uh, lawmaking. So uh, the primary legislative body was the ecclesia, the assembly, and free male citizens there would gather to propose, to debate, and to vote on different laws. Uh, in other city-states, of course, the situation was different. For example, in Sparta, there was a dual kinship with a council of elders, the Gerusia, and an assembly of uh, citizens, which was called the Apella. Now, several Greek cities also had uh, what we can call legendary lawgivers. So famous figures in the past, which promoted some specific um, uh, norms. In the case of Athens, we have Draco with his uh, famous homicide law. Of course, Solon in Athens, who was the father of constitutional reforms, and um, he addressed a lot of social uh, inequalities in, 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 in the sixth century uh, BC Athens. And in, in the case of Sparta, we could eventually mention some uh, lawgivers like Lycurgus. Now, what's interesting is that uh, in all these um, ancient cities, there was uh, a step to develop uh, written, uh, written legal codes. And in this sense, there was citizens who actively participated in the creation of this of these laws. So there was a proposed laws, nomoi, who were introduced by citizens in the course of the assembly. And if approved, these laws would be part of the legal uh, framework. Uh, 
Now, there's a slight difference in the whole regime uh, starting in 403 BC, uh, after the democracy was restored, because a board of nomothetai, lawgivers, was created. And the whole idea of this nomothetai was to examine proposals and to prevent inconsistencies and contradictions within the whole, the whole system. Now, the whole process of lawmaking and lawgiving was based on rhetoric. And this is uh, one of the interesting aspects of the Greek culture. Rhetoric played a crucial uh, role in this legisl legislative uh, process. Uh, the effective um, speaking skills to persuade others was one of the main characteristics of uh, citizens. The eloquence, the ability to sway public opinions in this, in this public uh, forum. And concerning uh, the existence of courts and, and I would say law giving, of course, there were former courts. We know uh, pretty well what happened in Athens. There were um, uh, chief magistrates called the Archontes. We had popular uh, democratic tribunals, the Dicasteria, with thousands or hundreds of citizens uh, being called in order to judge uh, specific, specific uh, um, affairs. And there were, in many cases, some specific courts as well. And this is quite interesting. For homicide, for example, we had uh, five different courts, depending on the type of homicide that had been committed. So depending on whether it was a justified homicide, whether it was an intentional homicide, whether it was a homicide by an inanimate object or by an unknown person, uh, you would eventually go to different tribunals. So I, as you can see, the whole system of law was quite complex in, in ancient Greece. And this is maybe why it's so interesting to, to talk of, of it uh, now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Emiliano. So, so if I uh, hear you correctly, and please do uh, do correct me if I get it wrong, but uh, I get the sense that in the Hellenic world, at least in Athens and uh, Sparta, the risk of over simplifying lawmaking was perhaps a more complex process, at least uh, during certain periods of time, than what we've heard perhaps about uh, uh, ancient Egypt, where where you know the, the sovereign, the, the ruler, might, might have had the uh, Mm -hmm. more centralized mm -hmm. uh, um, more centralized force in, in lawmaking. Uh, very interesting to hear about these different courts as well for different types of crimes. I'm wondering, you know, uh, 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 how that works, you know, if you have to qualify the crime before you choose the court, you know, maybe it seems like it prejudges a little bit, but, uh, but that's very interesting. Um, perhaps we'll come back to that later, Emiliano, but what you've talked about also raises a question for me, which is the uh, the, the the birth of the legal profession as well, the professionalization mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, legal practice, uh, and both for lawmaking and uh, and uh, law giving. So perhaps you know, if we can keep that in mind, uh, I'd like to come back to that later, maybe Belen. Sure. sure. And Paul, feel free to uh, chime in uh, if you, if you want. If you have anything to to add, we want to keep this as uh, uh, as interactive as possible. Uh, but otherwise, I'm happy to to, to uh, take us a bit closer to uh, uh, arbitration litigation. I should add, um, the one thing I wish to add at this point is that um, the Romans, like the Greeks before them, were very interested in written law. Mm -hmm. And the origins of the Roman legal order is attributed to um, a specific legal code um, of sorts, that was enacted around 450 BC, known as the Twelve Tables, and according to the tradition that was um, that describes the making of this law, an embassy um, of Romans went to Athens to study the laws of Solon, um, and came back with ideas about um, Roman uh, what Roman law should be. This. Um, this embassy to Athens story is very much debated also in terms of the practicality and, uh, uh, you know, the, the influence which we can see uh, directly in the Twelve Tables. But what we what we have in the Twelve Tables is a, is a sort of account, according to one of our later writers, of, of a, a social unrest put to bed, basically, between two factions in society, the uh, Patricians and the Plebeians. Um, and this leads... To a compromise, which is the twelve table. So it's interesting that um, we we find a kind of connection point, even if that connection point to the Romans there was a connection point with with Greece, um, and much like um, Emiliano has just said, uh, the Roman system bears very great similarities in terms of the making of laws to popular assembly, um, and also uh, the dealing. Uh, you know, how, how crimes were, for example, dealt with, with specific types of laws that were enacted for specific crimes. So, yeah, we see we see great elements of um, overlap or indeed continuity. 
Thanks, Paul. And yeah, of course, we're talking about these different civilizations as if they were separate, but in reality, we know that uh, they had, some civilizations have influenced others, especially the Romans had a, a particular interest in, a, in, the, in the, the Hellenic world uh, before them, so uh, we shouldn't forget that. Um, so perhaps moving on uh, closer to, uh, to arbitration and, uh, and litigation, uh, a, a question that is interesting to uh, to me in particular, and it was one of the reasons why we wanted to have this uh, webinar on this topic, was to explore this question, and it's the uh, uh, whether or not arbitration uh, uh, existed in uh, ancient civilizations and, and what it looked like. So by, by way of introduction, for uh, in order to make sure that we all talk about the same thing, we understand arbitration as a uh, process uh, uh, by which two or more disputants, parties, are going to confer, they're going to agree to confer on a third party neutral the power to uh, adjudicate the dispute, to uh, hear the dispute and make a binding decision on the parties. So it's parties conferring a power by agreement to a third party to, to make that decision, as opposed to, uh, I guess, a, a self-standing uh, or pre-existing judicial authority that, that has that power to make, uh, to make decisions. So, I guess my question is is uh, whether or not uh, arbitration, whether or not we have evidence of the, of the use of arbitration in uh, ancient civilizations. And the reason why I think the question is interesting is because if you look at the literature on international arbitration written by non-historians uh, and, and, and people who are not legal historians, a conventional assumption that you find very often, especially in the 20th uh, century, is uh, that uh, arbitration would be a fairly recent phenomenon, uh, which uh, would uh, essentially be a form of privatization of justice, whereby nation states would uh, benevolently uh, allow uh, um, parties to uh, exceptionally carve out their disputes of the otherwise applicable uh, jurisdiction of the centralized state courts of these nation states. And so arbitration is really seen and depicted often in the literature as, as this exceptional mechanism, uh, an exception to the, uh, the jurisdiction of the, the state courts. Uh, and so I guess it's a long winded introduction, but uh, Emiliano, perhaps if we can start with you, uh, uh, can, can we uh, What's your opinion on this, uh, focusing on, on Greece in particular? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Remy. Uh, so one of the interesting things to me is that uh, ancient Greeks were very aware of, of the existence of multiple ways of settling of settling disputes. Um, and, and we can see this just from the beginning of, of the text we have from the, from the Greek culture. So if you consider the first epic, which is uh, Homer's Iliad, there are a number of references to the existence probably of arbitrations. So uh, there's one uh, very interesting uh, part in, in the de depiction of, uh, of the shield of Achilles in book 18 of the Iliad, in which there is a depiction of a trial and there is an assembly of elders who are sitting in a sacred circle in an open market. And they're discussing about the blood price or the compensation for a murder. So perhaps in order to avoid the decision by, by a king, which at that time would be the right way of solving uh, a controversy. So this is what we already have in the archaic times. Now, in, in times of, of classical uh, um, Athens and other city-states, of course, as I said, the, this was the active participation of citizens that promoted not only the existence of laws, but also the dispute uh, resolutions through basically the judicial bodies. So there were, of course, private and public prosecutions which you could eventually take to the magistrate and the Archon Basileus would eventually choose the right, uh, the right tribunal to go. But in classical times, there's also uh, uh, some interesting sources which mention the existence of arbitration as an alternative to uh, litigation in court. And these sources start already in the late uh, fifth century. And there are two types of arbitration in, in, ancient, in ancient Athens. You have the private arbitration and the public arbitration, which were slightly uh, uh, different. The private arbitration, it's more or less, Remy, on, on, on what you were thinking. And I'm just thinking first of interpersonal arbitration within the system of, of a police, is two contestants 
who decide out of their free will to refrain from taking a specific controversy to, to a tribunal. And we have a very interesting passage of one of the main Greek orators, which is Demosthenes, in a speech against medias in which he describes the content of the law. And I'm just quoting, just for you to see how near and how close we are to modern definitions of arbitration, what arbitration is. I'm quoting Demosthenes. If any parties are in dispute concerning private contracts, and wish to choose any arbitrator, in, in Greek is diaitetes, it shall be lawful for them to choose whomsoever they wish. But when they have chosen by mutual agreement, they shall abide by his decisions and shall not transfer the same charges from him to another court, but the judgments of the arbitrators shall be final. So you can see there's a number of features there, the possibility of choosing who the arbitrators are, uh, the idea that this is obligatory, that it's a final, and of course, and this is something not specifically quoted there, but related to this, failure to comply would allow the winning party to exact uh, or extract payment of a fine, or eventually uh, the winning party could seize the property of the losing party if they did not comply with the arbitral uh, award. Uh, and there's also a, an interesting passage of Aristotle's rhetoric in which he says that it's better to go to an arbitrator than to a court because the arbitrator is based on equity, to APA case, whereas the judges of a court, they based their decisions on law, on nomos. And of course, equity seems to be more adequate in order to solve a specific uh, controversy. And there, there's, uh, apart from many interesting sources on this, there's comedy, um, usually stages a lot of situations of, of arbitration. There's this idea of public arbitration, which is the other arbitration you could see in Athens. And this is described also by the uh, constitution of the Athenians attributed to Aristotle. And he says that in order to avoid the workload of the courtrooms, it was decided to create a supervisory board of 40 individuals who would decide themselves on situations which were under or not exceeding 10 drachmae. Uh, you could think that one drachma was more or less equivalent to a day's wage of a skilled worker in, in classical Athens. If suits were above that value, they were forced to pass the claim to arbitrators who were designed among the citizens of 59 years of old and, uh, and above, and they would uh, eventually try to put the, 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 the parties together or eventually to give judgment. In this case, if one of the parties was not satisfied with the decision of the arbitrators, you could go to a court. But this is because this arbitration was forced, was mandatory, and it was not your own idea of choosing to go to, uh, to an arbitration. So uh, what, what, I, what I want to show here is that already in ancient Athens, there was quite a developed system of uh, coexistence between arbitration on the one side and formal uh, tribunals uh, on, the other, on the other hand. It's been interesting, Emiliano, and and uh, and I guess the uh, the uh, position is a lot more complex and perhaps nuanced than I or I'm sure others would have expected. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so there is very clearly evidence of use of arbitration in the Hellenic world, and in fact, a form of arbitration that looks very similar to what we uh, we know today. That there's there is evidence of a use of different types of dispute resolution mechanisms that are you know halfway between a what we would call a litigation, I guess, an arbitration. But at the same time, if I hear you correctly, Emiliano, you seem to be saying that there was probably always in the background also the the the, the, the justice of the sovereign, of the prince, of the uh, uh, so, so there was some measure of uh, I don't want to uh, jump to a future questions, but there, there was a measure of a jurisdictional competition a bit or, or, or not. Uh, or, Yes, in classical times, not with the king, but basically with the formal and regular uh, popular uh, tribunals I was just discussing. So there was, uh, in private arbitration, there was the possibility of deciding among citizens, because of course, the politi, the citizens, were the basis of the system. They could eventually rely on a third party, maybe another citizen, in order to solve a situation. And this, this is present also in, in different texts. So there's there's a, a comedy by Menander, which is called Epitrepontes, the arbitration. And it's two citizens that just, they find someone walking in the street and they're discussing about a baby which was found. Uh, this is of course comic with the trinkets and uh, a lot of things that come with the baby. And they want to be who the owner of the baby is. And they just tell one of the citizens that goes by, which 
Later, we know that he happens to be the grandfather of the of the baby, and, but he doesn't know. And uh, they just ask him, okay, who does this baby belong to? And this is kind of everyday arbitration that you would find uh, in Athens in the in the fourth century BCE. Very interesting. I hope we come back uh, in questions or later on in discussions uh, on this issue of uh, jurisdictional competition. It reminds me, you know, in uh, recent times, you know, the, 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 the jurisdictional competition that we see in, uh, in the world of investor state arbitration between yeah. investment arbitration tribunals and uh, the European Union, etc., and, and uh, points at uh, you know land grabbing, etc. So they're very, very, very interesting and very relevant today. Uh, uh, Yana. Uh, and Paul, I don't know if you have anything to add about the uh, evidence or lack thereof uh, of the use of arbitration in uh, Egypt, I guess, and uh, Roma. Yeah, if I can add something. So as I've mentioned before, like professional or specialized courts of justice and judges, probably equivalent to the uh, to Ptolemaic Laocrites, uh, were established in Egypt relatively late, only in the 7th or 6th century BC. And until this period, the courts consisted of officials, seru, who actually held both administrative and judicial duties. But in ancient Egypt, individuals had the option of resorting to a single arbitrator to resolve their legal disputes and therefore uh, thereby circumventing formal court proceedings. But the challenge in our case lies in the scarcity of information about arbitration, unlike uh, the more documented court proceedings. But as for the court system, we know that it comprised various levels, ranging from local courts and judges handling community matters to the so-called Great Canabat, the Great Court. The Great Canabat was presided over by the vizier and overseen by the royal scribe as the ruler's representative. So we have the role of the king involved here. And uh, it addressed, of course, the most serious offenses. And notably, the members of these courts did not appear to possess any specialized knowledge on, for example, legal formulae, uh, which were provided by professional scribes likely assigned to court sessions and representing the vizier, who actually himself held supreme control over city and temple courts, as these are the two types we know the best of. And if we go to private matters, uh, the responsibility for instigating a legal resolution to an offense actually rested with the victim. Although numerous details of the administrative and unfortunately also legal procedures remain somewhat unclear in the evidence. So which especially holds for the Egyptian history before the Ptolemaic period. So it seems that the commencement of a court case involved the submission of a written complaint followed by a response from the opposing party. But we know that the court hearing took place orally with both sides of the dispute presenting their perspectives on the matter. And it's also noteworthy that neither the plaintiff nor the defendant had legal representation akin to professional lawyers, as such roles are not documented in ancient Egypt at all. So consequently, individuals may have initially sought arbitration before embarking on the formal court process as the Egyptian legal system was largely informal. And it cannot be entirely ruled out that the officials who were otherwise engaged in court proceedings might have also undertaken the role of arbitrators. Additionally, also elderly family members who might have been directly engaged in the arbitration process also contributed to the resolution of the disputes. But as I've already mentioned, our evidence is much more limited than in the case of ancient Greece. Thank you, Yana. And, and Paul, I don't know if you want to have anything to add from the uh, point of view of uh, Roman law. All I would say is um, uh, it's, it all sounds very familiar. And the, um, uh, the idea that arbitration uh, is a feature that comes after litigation in a state, I think, is um, comprehensively refuted also in the case of, of Rome, um, where there is ample evidence and also documentary evidence of arbitration. So I, I don't think it the, the order in which those things appear necessarily that way. Um, they were always alternatives. Um, yeah. And that question is really, uh, again, very relevant and very important today, just to make it uh, plain from a theoretical point of view, because uh, without you know uh, turning this webinar on the history of arbitration litigation into a webinar about the th legal theory and uh, legal philosophy, uh, but but the proponents of of, uh, uh, of uh, traditional uh, 
theories of arbitration regard arbitration as a process that only exists and that can only exist within the context of a domestic legal system. Uh, so arbitration as a process only exists according to uh, the proponents of the that theory, of, of which I am not, uh, uh, because the state through its laws makes it possible for parties through party autonomy to, to agree to give a competence to an arbitrator to render a dispute, uh, decision, decision which is an instrument that only exists within the, the, the legal system. And, and of course, the proponents of transnational stateless law theories of arbitration look at things slightly differently. And so uh, you know, go, going back in time and seeing that maybe arbitration and uh, court litigation have uh, always existed to probably uh, alongside each other, regardless of, uh, of the existence of, uh, of state-based uh, law is, I think, very interesting from a theoretical point of view. Uh, so I wanted to ask another question, but I think with uh, your answers, I've uh, preempted that question a bit. I wanted to uh, explore a bit more uh, what law giving the adjudication, litigation, arbitration uh, of disputes uh, look like in uh, in these different uh, ancient civilizations, looking at, for example, what type of uh, adjudicators we had. Did we have, uh, so Yana talked of individuals who held probably administrative and judicial uh, functions. Uh, we, we talked about uh, in Greece of uh, uh, private parties, persons, you know, passerby being asked to uh, arbitrate a dispute. But is there anything more we can say about who these adjudicators were? Uh, uh, in particular, was there really a clear demarcation or separation between the making of law and the application of law? Uh, I'd be surprised if there was, because in modern day uh, uh, legal uh, practice in administrative law in many jurisdictions, you have administrative agencies that are going to have the power both to enact certain regulations, but also interpret the regulations, even potentially uh, uh, adjudicate the application of these regulations. So it's, uh, but, but I'd love to hear about uh, what uh, uh, these uh, adjudicators uh, were like in, uh, in these ancient civilizations, if there's anything else we can say about it. Maybe well, I, in a poll, go I, ahead. Yeah, I, I can say for Rome that we have um, the names of some of the arbiters and we can uh, we can trace back who they were in the context of the history of it. So um, for individuals, uh, although few and far between, it is possible to, um, to see how they fit into the sort of broader um, scheme of things. Yeah, that's certainly possible. But we're not talking necessarily about individuals holding uh, uh, state responsibilities or administrative responsibilities, like public functionaries, I guess, uh, if the concept even existed in Rome. I'm, I'm not no, sure. not necessarily. They might be, um, they might have a little bit more training, you know, uh, in a sense than uh, your average person. But much like in the two legal systems we've just been talking about, it was essentially a process whereby um, individuals could choose anybody to... Um, you know, to adjudicate the dispute. Maybe it's, it's a very quick follow-up question. That will be my last question before I pass the microphone to Belen. But Paul, I've heard once, I don't know if it's true, that the prof professionalization of a law legal practice started with Rome. Uh, that that uh, Rome is when we first started to see a cast of individuals who, uh, whose job was to, uh, I guess, practice law or, or deal with... Uh, legal uh, um, materials and, and be paid for, for, for these services. Is that is that right? Or, or, is the, or is this, again, a conventional assumption that's not really based on a much actual evidence? Well, it certainly is possible to identify a professionalization of, um, of law in the late Republic. So the first century BC, um, leading on to the first and second century AD. Um, whether Rome is unique in that respect is a, is a matter for my two esteemed colleagues to tell me. Um, certainly, Rome has always held a specific place in the popular imagination, and therefore it may be um, that it has been seen as something very peculiar as opposed to a more general trend. But we can certainly identify it in Rome, um, and it is possible to, um, you know, to have grand discussions about the law becoming a, a separate sphere of... of, of um, uh, of practice uh, and, you know, autopoietic, if you want to use big, big words, um, with its own, uh, you know, with its own uh, way of, of creating responses to, to legal problems. So yeah, there's certainly um, a lot that can be said about that. And a lot has been said about that. But whether that makes Roman law unique, as opposed to 
um, just you know indicative of, of of a sort of see of, of an event that happens in other legal systems as well. It's not for me to say. Thank you, Paul. I don't know if Emiliano or Yana, if you have something to add on the professionalization of a of of the law of legal practice, but otherwise I'll uh, I'll let Belen take over. Okay, my question, my first question is for Emiliano. Uh, we have already discussed that there's evidence of arbitration to solve disputes between privates, between individuals, these both the public and the private arbitration. Um, is there evidence in ancient Greece of the use of arbitration to resolve state-to-state -state disputes as well? Yeah, yes, Belen, a, a lot of evidence we have. I, I, I can just show th this volume on, in, on uh, arbitration, state arbitrations in the Greek world, just to show a little uh, how much how much we, we have. But uh, just to summarize a little, um, the, um, based on more or less the same principles I was just uh, referring to concerning private arbitration, the idea was expanded in order to solve uh, uh, responsibilities or, or problems between city-states uh, with the designation of a third party. So they sought to a third party in order to solve uh, controversies among, among polis in the classical period. And this is something we, we can see throughout the Greek world, and it's very uh, extensive. It's not only limited, of course, to the practice of, uh, of Athens. Um, just to mention one example, for example, and, and Thucydides, who is the uh, big historian of the Peloponnesian War, he mentions several cases of, uh, of arbitrations, and in one specific situation, which is the a treaty between Sparta and Argos, which are two uh, classical polis, um, a treaty which was signed in um, 418 BC, there is a compromise, there is an, uh, an uh, arbitration clause, which is very clear. I'm going to just quote the, the passage. Uh, he, he's telling the content of the treaty, and he says, if any of the cities have a question, whether of frontiers or otherwise, it must be settled. But if one allied city should have a quarrel with another allied city, it must be referred to some third city thought impartial by both parties. Private citizens shall have their dispute decided according to the laws of, this, of their um, several um, countries. So this kind of, of compromise is found elsewhere in the Greek world. So we have examples in the 30 years pace in uh, 446 BCE. We have it also in the Peace of Nicias in 421 BCE. So we have plenty of, of uh, cases in which this sort of, of uh, recourse to arbitration among polis uh, uh, took place. Now, what was the object, basically, of most of these, of these arbitrations? Well, disputes in general, uh, and of course, I'm generalizing here, but they, they revolved around basic issues concerning either military alliances, um, basically mutual defense, um, in case there was some controversy concerning the deployment of military action. And maybe even more general, um, territorial boundaries situations, which would eventually include aspects concerning religion, uh, the situation of sacred sites or shrines which were placed at the borderline between two different, two different polis. But there was also some uh, specific uh, um, uh, arbitral arrangements concerning trade agreements, claims for damage, uh, perceived violation of treaties, among, uh, among others. There were two ways of dealing practically with this. Either you would call on a third city, which is called the uh, polis ecletos, and that city would send um, nationals in order to solve the dispute. We have even one case in which a city, which is uh, Miletos, sent 600 arbitrators to solve a frontier dispute uh, uh, between Sparta and Mycenae. We have one beautiful text uh, of a dispute between Samos and Priene in Asia, in Asia Minor, uh, 196 uh, BCE, in which Rhodes as a city was called to uh, settle the dispute. And we have the whole decision of the arbitrators, which is kind of unique in the ancient world. It's one of the best preserved examples of arbitral awards in, in, uh, in antiquity. And another possibility was not just going to another city, but just uh, uh, convening and summoning a group of foreign judges. You would also, you would call for foreign judges. And some cities in the Hellenistic times were very uh, widely known for their expertise, the expertise of their elites in providing this sort of help with arbitration. One example is the island of Kos, 
uh, that was famous in antiquity because it provided arbitrators for uh, almost all of the known uh, Greek, Greek world. Uh, in Hellenistic times, from the late fourth century BCE, this whole system expanded a lot and arbitrations would just become uh, one of the major features of, of interstate relations uh, among, among Greek uh, polis and, and confederations. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, Paul, do you want to chime in with something regarding yes. Rome? Um, yes, um, so we've just heard about interstate arbitration in, in the kind of Greek world and in the Roman world, it um, you know there's plenty of evidence, especially in the first part of the Republic, of, of a similar kind of uh, of practice. I should just go back and say about private arbitration between between individuals. The Roman way of doing it was using a contract. So they had a contract known as a, a verbal contract, a stipulatio, in which the two parties agree that they will go into arbitration. Um, and this was a very interesting way of, of doing it because we have a we have a kind of oversight by the Praetorian um, official who's at the head of the Roman legal system in which they basically supervise what is going on in this system of, of, of contract-based arbitration. Um, and they could also arrange for uh, the arbiter to be appointed and the arbiter made a kind of contract with the parties as well in which he basically um, agreed that he would come to a decision and and so on and so forth. So in, in Roman law, although we're not, there is one digest title about it uh, in Justinian's digest, of course, but our focus, much like Jana said before, has been so exclusively on litigation as a form of dispute resolution that a lot more work can be done on arbitration using contracts. Although we do have some examples, of course, for example, from Putioli, um, you know, there are wonderful cases where the arbitration agreement is actually um, written down. Now, just to say then, when it comes to interstate arbitration, um, again, there is, uh, there is evidence for this. I'll give you two examples of very good evidence that we have. Um, in the early part of the Republic, from about 509 BC onwards, Rome expanded first along the uh, Italian peninsula using treaties, and a lot of those treaties would also involve uh, issues of jurisdiction. So whether you had access to the Roman legal system, to Roman trade routes and so on and so forth. So Livy tells us quite a lot about that. But one of the most beautiful examples that we have um, comes from a document discovered, a, a bronze document discovered in 1979 in Saragossa in Spain, known as the Tabula Contrebiensis. And this is a first century BC document involving the Roman state arbitrating a dispute between three different Celto-Iberian tribes. And um, there, a lot of the dispute um, is coached in very specific Roman legal language. And basically what happened was um, one tribe sold land to another tribe for the creation of a sort of irrigation canal and a third tribe objected to the sale of this land we're not quite sure what the reason for the objection was, but it has something to do with whether the, um, you know, whether this was private land or public land and so on and so forth. And so what happens is a third city, much like Emiliano has just been saying, Contrebia, the Senate of that city has been called upon to act as a judge in this matter. But the matter is being kind of set up in a way which is very technical Roman legal language. And we know um, that th there was a kind of a Roman law expert behind the way in which the language was set up. Um, and th this also brings me back to the point about uh, private arbitration. So kind of what was the law that was applied there? Um, here, it's a very strange idea. So the law that they're applying is effectively Roman law, even though it has nothing to do with Roman law, because it's effectively the law of these three Celto Iberian tribes there, but they're they're framing it in Roman law concepts in order to apply something which would be familiar to a Roman audience. Another example, for example, as we all know, in 155 BC, um, three very famous um, Greek orators visited Rome. Um, and what led up to their visiting of Rome was of course that the Romans and the Athenians had had some sort of skirmish before um, about a city which had been raided. Um, and so um, in an attempt to make peace and to dissolve, resolve that issue of the raid of this city, they appointed a third city in order to arbitrate between the Romans and the Athenians. And the Athenians then didn't turn up to the arbitration. And so they were fined quite a huge sum of money. And so these orators came to, uh, came to Rome basically to address the Senate to try and get the fine overturned. 
um, because they were, um, you know, they were. It was a huge sum of money. I think something like five hundred talents or something of that kind. So, you know, it it was a it was a vast sum of money. So we see that kind of um, type of dispute resolution mechanism of 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 um, not just in the private arbitration but also in the in the state arbitration. And um, I, I think there's kind of a connection there, probably. For sure. Thank you, Paul. This is something that Emiliano mentioned in one of his answers, uh, using arbitration to solve uh, religious disputes. Um, we know that faith arbitration has existed for centuries and it continues to do so today. Um, Jana, was, were, was there an overlap or connection between the legal and the religious or spiritual in Egypt? Yes, certainly. There are actually several instances from Egypt where an overlap or interconnection between the legal and religious or spiritual realms is evident. And one of, uh, well, one noteworthy example would be the oracular practice, which held a significant importance in Egyptian religious and social life. Uh, so similar to legal proceedings, which were accessible to individuals regardless of their gender or social status, uh, also oracles were open to all from rulers and dignitaries to ordinary people. So in a basic sense, this practice involved consulting the deity through their public image. So typically, questions posed to the deity were straightforward and practical, often seeking a yes or no answer, and typically occurring during religious festivals when individuals were seeking, well, those individuals who were seeking answers from the gods approached the divine image, and often in a form of a statue, which was placed in a bark, carried on the shoulders of priests. And in this ritual, the deity represented by the statue would respond the question through the movements of the bark, offering guidance or insight to those seeking divine counsel. So the earliest evidence of this oracular practice dates back to the New Kingdom, so roughly half of the second millennium BC. However, the most abundant evidence comes from later phases of the Egyptian history, like later Ramesside side period and third intermediate period, so late second and early first millennium BC. And comprehensive insights into this practice are actually gleaned from individual oracular degrees, which are preserved in monumental form on temple walls or inscribed on papyrus and utilized as amulets. References to these processes are also found in administrative records, and uh, we also have a limited number of petitions directed to the gods on papyri or ostraca. So we also have the statues of gods and their depictions on reliefs, which are clearly associated with oracles. So this is actually something we can contribute a lot to. And geographically, the majority of the examples actually come from the Theban region, and therefore it is not surprising that uh, the most requests for divine consultations are directed to the divine uh, triad, Theban triad, and frequently the chief deity Amun or Amunre. But also deified kings such as Amenhotep I uh, could also receive these appeals. So, but in general, um, the oracles could be uttered by any pro uh, processional image. And uh, I've already mentioned a divine statue carried in a bark, but there were also many other forms. The divine statue could be hidden in a tabernacle, it could be sitting in a polokin or mounted directly on poles. The statues were both hidden and visible to the public, and um, the practice itself was actually quite versatile and encompassed various cases ranging from a selection of a, high, a new high priest of the god Amun at the very beginning of the reign of Ramses II to the resolution of a property dispute. Um, well, even like they could actually identify a thief for, for this, they could also use the divine oracle. So uh, in cases where the oracle was employed to choose the, the individual, whether to determine someone who was worthy of the office or to identify someone who had committed an offense. The image of the god was carried around the person in question and during the moment of selection, the image would spontaneously come to a stop. Uh, additionally, the image of the god could respond to questions posed by the priest and approval was indicated through uh, something we can translate from Egyptian as nodding which we understand as a forward movement, while disapproval was expressed by a backward movement. 
So it's indeed intriguing that the ancient Egyptians were cognizant of the practical limitations inherent in this oratory practice, particularly regarding the potential for corruption and external influence on such decisions. We actually do have an extant record from the time of Ramses IV, uh, which details an accusation against the priest Pan Anukat of Elephantini for the crime of falsifying the oracle of the god Hnum. But uh, similar cautions against such misconduct are echoed in wisdom texts and other documents. But despite these warnings, however, the presence of numerous distinguished priests and other prominent figures of local society probably served to instill a degree of confidence that the God's verdict would be just. And so therefore, consequently, it was generally accepted as valid. So we do have these overlaps between the world of like legal world and, and divine. And that, this is something that uh, was mentioned before by Rami, this issue of jurisdictional competition between uh, arbitration and national courts. Um, we have that issue uh, in England and France with the royal courts versus the non-royal royal courts. And now we're seeing this tension between arbitration and courts uh, in the European Union and, and ISDS tribunals. So Paul, uh, briefly, uh, could you please uh, let us know if this phenomenon could also be observed in Rome? Not necessarily Maybe. so. Um, the the short answer is, of course, uh, from the documentation or the evidence that we have, some types of disputes had to be taken to court, while other types of disputes were the preserve of private arbitration. Um, I have to say this might also have factored into people's decisions whether to arbitrate or whether to litigate. The Roman courtroom was a public forum and um, one had to essentially wash one's dirty laundry in public and the public could sit around and watch while your, you know, your um, private thoughts and deeds were exposed. And so um, it, it might have it might have been more preferable to use an arbitration situation, which was essentially private. Um, I have to say, in certain types of disputes, we've already heard from the other panelists about, for example, land issues, um, issues about land surveying and so on. There was a practice that things of this kind generally went to arbitration. And there's a very good example um, from the epigraphic record uh, in the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum. Um, it's a first century AD document, a recording, uh, um, basically a, a case of land dispute and an arbiter was there involved um, called um, Gaius Helvidius Priscus, if I remember correctly, who was a very high status Roman. And uh, this involved a dispute about a boundary line between an individual called Tilius Sassius and the, the city council of, of, of Histioni. Um, and um, this was a question about whether, you know, um, whether the boundary line had been moved surreptitiously or where the boundary line fell. And so we, we know that things such as that generally went to arbitration. We also have good evidence from the, uh, the agronomist literature that we have in Roman law um, about land disputes going that way. But other things generally had to be taken to litigation. For example, if there was a claim that you were free, in other words, liberty claims, or where it involved um, relationships that weren't commercial, for example, guardianship uh, or tutelage um, or things of that kind, those things could not be arbitrated over. They had to um, they had to go to litigation. Now, could you appeal against an arbitration decision? <laughs> the answer is uh, probably not in the Roman sphere. Um, certainly one of the arbitration documents that we have suggests that you could also include a clause, as Emiliano has said, that you will not take it further. Um, there isn't a formalized system of appeals, even in litigation terms in the Roman context until uh, well into the empire, in which case it, it is also a bit hit and miss. It's not a regularized system of appeals to, for example, the court of the, of the governor and they, to the court of the emperor and so on. I think it takes us uh, to the end of the time that we had, uh, Belen, if I'm not mistaken. The good news is that, as we explained, we have this 
continue the conversation uh, webinar that is going to start now, uh, which is now a traditional feature of webinars organized by uh, the American Society of International Law. Uh, the continue the conversation webinar is a bit different because the attendees will be able to ask their questions directly. So apologies for not being able to uh, read the questions that some of you wrote into the chat, but please do join us in the continue the conversation webinar and we'll be able to ask your questions directly to our uh, panelists.